good morning, everybody. <laughs> this is Dr. Taylor Clem. I'm with UF IFAS Extension, Nassau County. Um, and I am our horticulture agent and master gardener volunteer coordinator. And this is part of our monthly landscape matters program. And uh, it's all about palms in Northeast Florida. Um, and, you know, when, when you move to Florida or you're new, if you're new to the area, especially North Florida, you know, you might think of different palms, um, but honestly, there's actually a very like great diversity of palms that we can actually grow in Florida, at least in North Florida. Um, you know, cause like some of the palms that I, I really like, you can't actually grow here because we just get too cold. Um, but when you actually like go digging through all the material and looking at the different types of palms, there's actually a lot of palms that do really well in, in this part of the state. And, um, you know, before we get going, what are some of y'all's like favorite palm trees that you like that you think of when you think of a palm what's something you think of you can put that in the chat box dropping things yeah oh that's one of my favorites Ah, still learning about all the different kinds of palms. Yes, absolutely. So uh, we had one mention of cabbage palm. That's a wonderful, that's our state palm tree. Um, it's also like the state tree for like Georgia and South Carolina, Alabama. No, not Alabama. I can't remember all the states that have that as their uh, state palm. But the cabbage palm is a wonderful native tree. It's, you know, it's a, one of our native palms. I love it. It's super easy to put in the landscape. It's super tough and resilient. And that's one of the first palms that I think of when I think of palms in our area. So, um, but as part of our program today, you know, we'll talk about a cabbage palm. Yes, but our goal is to kind of talk about the general palm maintenance and some of those other unique palms that you can get in the landscape. So what I'm going to do is I'm recording this whole presentation. So I'll send you a link to our YouTube channel so you can watch the recording, as well as I'll send you some of our publications that list a lot of this information that we're going to go over today. So you can always go back and revisit it, etc. So um, one of the big things I want us to ask or answer is which palms grow best in North Florida? And we're not gonna talk about all of them because it's actually a pretty extensive list, but we're gonna talk about some of the fun ones um, and ones that I like to use when I'm like doing landscape designs or um, just ones that I know that are tough and resilient. So the ones that I can give as recommendations um, and are relatively easy to find. A lot of the palms that we have listed in our palm publication can be very tough, tough, tough to find. But you'll get that publication that lists all those different species and their growing conditions. Um, but we'll also talk about what are the management recommendations and key pests to palms. So at the end of the presentation, you should have more comfort to talk or being able to remember or reflect on this information. So um, anyway, so let's talk about palms. Actually, no, I don't wanna jump into that that quickly. When you think about palms, What's some of the things that you think about? And you put that in a chat box, of course. What do you think about when you think of palms? It could be good things, bad things, concerns, exciting things. Yeah, that's a good one. Palms, palms provide that perfect tropical look. Yeah, it's the aesthetic to them. It's just you associate with the tropics. What are some other things? Because in that same vein, at least with that tropical look, you know, I, I've told people before, you probably, some of you probably heard me say this, like when I first moved to Florida back in 2000, you know, I was like, oh man, we're moving to Florida. Um, I'm so excited, the land of palm trees, beaches and all that stuff. And I moved to uh, Jacksonville. So I quickly learned that it was pine trees, you know, saw palmettos, which I love, but it's completely different look than I expected, oak trees, etc. So, um, but it is kind of nice to know that, yeah, it didn't have that tropic look at first, and I've come to love this and respect this actually more so this North Florida look, but it's really cool to still know that, you know, at least with that tropical look, we can find palms that do really well, that can kind of give us that effect and aesthetic and are also Florida friendly because they're easy, right plant, right place. Palms grow so well in Florida, our natural just environments and our conditions are just perfect for pretty much all palms to grow. 
the only stipulation if you live somewhere where you have poor drainage obviously palms may not do too terribly well but there are some and like if you're doing your yard and you have poor drainage there are some ways that you can remedy your soil or amend your soil a little bit to help with palms to grow but anyway so let's talk about palms um so you know before we jump into the specifics of different types of palms let's review what a palm tree is well palms are not actually trees technically uh, we consider them woody herbs and that's because they lack what we call secondary growth so primary growth of trees and uh, palms is like that elongation or that growing whether it be height or roots growing outwards branches growing outwards that's typically what we call a primary growth secondary growth is associated with like if you think of like an oak tree it's planted and it's small but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger so palms don't necessarily do that they have they don't really have secondary growth so it's kind of a unique component to palms. Uh, so they're more sometimes recommended considered woody herbs from a botanical perspective, but it's really easy just to call them trees anyways. No one's gonna, the only person I'd argue would be a botanist. But anyways, um, and they're monocots. So they actually have their vascular system. Um, their bundles are actually all throughout the trunk, whereas dicots, it's going to be typically around the exterior of the tree. Um, but anyways, and this is kind of like a cross section of a palm. Um, it's definitely different because you're not going to see like those you're not always going to see like those ring age. You, you, you can, but it's it looks a little bit different. Um, roots continually grow as palms, which is really, really cool. So they actually have very vast root networks, which makes them more resilient to a lot of our storms. Uh, and that's why they do, I mean, that's why palm trees do so well in our, our big storms like hurricanes, tropical storms, etc. Because if you think about it, they evolved in those conditions. So they've adapted to those conditions, which makes it really cool. So it makes palms a really nice, tough choice for our area because they've evolved in those high storm events and they have these very cool, vast, fine root systems that kind of run all over the place. Um, they only have one area of growth and that's actually at that top of the palm where the fronds are coming out. You know, the atypical meristem, uh, but that bud area at the top, that's where that growth is occurring. So the heart of palm is whoop up at the canopy of the tree. Um, and after a certain point, like I mentioned, that secondary growth, they do get a little bit wider at first, but they they limit that width growth. That's that lim limited to secondary growth. So palms are kind of unique in that condition. They're monocot. They don't really have that secondary growth. They have vast root systems as part of their adaption to our environment. So it makes them a really resilient, tough, tough palm. So our plant. Um, and when we look at palms there's actually like three major classifications of the different palm fronds now obviously you're not gonna um I, I don't expect you all to know all of this but there are these three major classifications um we have that palmate and i remember palmate because it looks like a hand you know palm palmate so and like our saw palmettos um sand palmettos, door palmettos, those all kind of have that palmate leaf. And the petiole, you know, the stem of the leaf, whoop, you know, it ends, and then you have the fronds, whoop, all kind of stick out on it, right? So then there is the pinnate leaf, which has this petiole, the, the petiole, and then you can actually see, I'm going to draw on this so you can see it, because it might be easier for me to do that. So you have this petiole right here, and then it becomes what we call the rachis or rachis, and it extends all the way up through the front. Whereas on the palmate, you just have the petiole. That's it. It doesn't have this rachis. And then um, you have all these individual leaflets from the frond itself kind of stick off of it. So that's kind of like mule palm, Canary Island date palms. They have that kind of that look, that pinnate leaf. But then you have this costa or costa palmate leaf which is a little bit different so it doesn't it's kind of like a hybrid between the two it doesn't have a rachis but it does have this what we call a costa where it actually extends a little bit further into the palm and um and we see this on things like a cabbage palm is a good example but anyway so these are the common um uh, types of palm fronds that we do have so, whoops, let me get rid of all that. And where's my clear button? Oh, there we go. 
All right. So, um, so let's talk about palms in North uh, Florida or Northeast Florida. So palm suitable. So North Florida must be able to like withstand periods of below freezing temperatures because like this fall, I mean this fall, this winter, we had some really, really cold nights and obviously some hard freezes. And there's some palms that just cannot tolerate it at all. So our palms have to be able to withstand those intermittent freezes. And we actually have some palms that are known that like it can get, it can be snowing on them and they'll be happy as a clam because they're, um, they can tolerate those cool, cool temperatures. So, um, Anyways, so one of those ways that we kind of classify, like many of you may know, what um, the most appropriate area to grow a lot of our palms or any of our plants is based off of our climate zone, our climate region. And we use what we call the USDA hardiness scale to do so. And that's based off of that average low temperature of the season. And in Nassau County, we actually are broken up into two zones. So uh, we are 8B and 9A. A. So that's going to be important to know. So the west side or the interior part of the county is typically a little bit cooler than the coastal area. Um, and so that means that that can impact, you know, palms that you want to select on the west side of the county. Um, they'll do well on the east side of the county, but we have some palms that might do well on the east side of the county that may not do well on the west side of the county. So knowing your uh, hardiness zone is going to be very important. Um, and in, like I mentioned, in our county, we're split between 8B and 9A. Um, and usually, like, again, I'll let me pull up the little drawing tool. Right here is that line of where we see that division between the two. Um, but typically, when we're talking to people, we just say, if you're west of the interstate, you know, you're 8B. If you're east of the interstate, you're 9A. Because that just gives us a geographic demarcation, you know, um, that we can say, or you could say, like, I don't know, US 1 <laughs> might be it. But, anyways, so that's important to know about our hardiness zones because we have palms that will do well on the east side of the county, but maybe not the west side of the county. So, knowing your USDA hardiness zone is going to be very important. And that's not just for palms, but that's for all plants. So how, does, how do we improve cold tolerance? Because that's the biggest limiting effect or factor for our palms. So we can actually improve the cold tolerance of some of our plant species or, you, or those palms or you, as part of that selection and placement in your landscape to help protect them a little bit more. So what you can do is you can do that gradual cooling. So if like say you planted a palm in like the sp uh, in the spring goes to the summer and in the fall it can kind of like slowly adapt and get used to those cold temperatures now i want to recommend bringing a palm from south florida in the middle of the winter and plopping it up here it will not do well so we call that like hardening off it's giving your plants a period of uh a period of time that allows them to adapt to adapt to a local landscape um, so allowing for that gradually cooling off can help them get a little bit tougher or withstand those cooler temperatures. Um, but also their ability to withstand those cold freezes and snaps is really going to be influenced by like the length of freeze, how hard of a freeze is it going to be, wind speed and relative humidity have a huge impact on it. So in our cooler time of the year, our prevailing winds are typically coming from the northwest. So they're, that cold wind is coming in, it just makes it a little bit worse on that temperature in those plants. Um, so knowing about that is going to have an impact on our plant placement. So it's always kind of nice, you know, you can put palms around buildings because that can help shelter them from the prevailing winds. So if you have the opportunity to put like a palm on like the southeast edge of a building or of a property, uh, that can help protect them from those winds. So it kind of creates what we call a microclimate. So it might be a little bit warmer there because immediately surrounding our homes is always a little bit warmer than like the exterior parts of our property. So and then also it's important to know that since heat rises, you know, if we have low portions of our of our property or lower parts of our property that are significantly lower, um, those are typically on average going to be a little bit cooler than if you have a, a higher area. But that's usually going to be something if you are have a much larger property that you're dealing with. So, but of course, you know, those are just factors that can help improve the cold tolerance. But when it comes to a palm being able to withstand cold, that really comes down to just the palm itself. You know, uh, it can be impacted by its age, height, 
um, it's environmental exposures, it's DNA, just how it has evolved in itself, um, it's native habitat and overall health. So if you have a healthy palm, it's been established in this area for a while, and it's a cold tolerant, it's going to do well, it'll be fine, it's not going to have an issue at all. But say you have a young palm, it might be more susceptible to damage. If you're bringing it in from somewhere else, it might not be used to those freezes yet. Or if you're not managing it well, it might be more susceptible to cold damage because, or it won't be able to um, rebound or recover um, as compared to, you know, more or healthier plants. So anyways, let's go ahead and let's talk about palms. So these are the palms for your landscape. And then like I mentioned, we're only going to talk about just like a handful of them or some of my favorites in um, and I'm going to include like those growing conditions, but I'm going to send you an EDIS publication that actually includes like a whole list of palms that can grow in our part of the state, which is a wonderful, wonderful document. So, you know, the most common palms that we see in our landscapes are typically going to be like a cabbage palm, um, a pindo palm, or a Washington palm. Um, I see those quite a bit. Um, and like earlier, someone mentioned that one of their favorite palms is the cabbage palm or that sable palmetto. In this picture, um, you're actually looking at a Washington palm or Washingtonia robusta, which actually gets pretty daggone tall. It gets like 70, 80 feet tall in some situations. And um, I've noticed in some of the communities around uh, Nassau County that when the builders or developers put in trees, um, in those new homes, they'll put a Washington palm in, which I think is probably not, the, the tree will do fine, no problem, but I just don't think it's the right plant for the right place because um, they get so tall. So you'll, you know, it's these small properties, you'll come out and it's just like, there's palms like way, way, way up over your head. So it doesn't fit well into the scale and proportion of a building, um, unless you have a much larger property where you can put them in big clusters or groups. But um, those are all tough, tough palms. I, they do really, really well. The pindo palm is very cold tolerant. And it's also called a jelly palm because you can actually take the fruit off of it and people will turn it into jellies and jams, et cetera. So those are the most common ones. Um, so let's go ahead and let's jump into some of these more unique ones or ones that I like to recommend. Um, so this is actually one of our native palms and it is, it is, um, and I've seen it uh, in Nassau County if someone's planted it and it does look really nice. This is called the Everglades palm and it is a clustering palm, which I, which I really like those clustering palms like this um, compared to like a solitary palm, but this actually grows in 9A to 11. So it's going to be, you can, you can pretty much grow it around the county. Now, if you're in the far west side of the county, you might not be able to do too well with big cold snaps or freezes, but it gets about 20 feet tall. And I just really love that this, this clustering form of uh, the palm. Uh, it does well in full to part sun. It has those palmate leaves, um, but it has a really cool silvery green frond color to it, which I think from a design perspective, that ends up adding really cool contrast to a landscape because it has that varying green, so it can add a really cool pop of color. Um, and it does have a moderate salt tolerance, which is another big bonus thing that we need to think about because not all palms are salt tolerant. Some will, if they get any aerosol salt spray on them at all, they're like, ooh, and they succumb to it. So um, it's gonna be important to think about that salt tolerance, especially with where you live in Nassau County. Um, but it, a neat thing is this is, one, like I mentioned, this is one of our native uh, palms and it's native to the Everglades. So if you've ever been, have any of you ever been down to the Everglades and seen any of these growing naturally? I know I, I've seen them, but that's of course I was looking for them or I yeah, recognize them. So this is a cool one. This is also a neat one because it's also like people will use it as an indoor house plant, which is really cool. So um, this is called a dwarf, dwarf sugar palm. So the dwarf sugar palm, same type of condition zone 9A to 11, but it's it's much smaller. It's gonna be about six to eight feet tall. Um, it likes that fold apart sun. It has that pinnate leaf. So it's like a big feather. Um, and it can actually get like dark green fronds. Now, um, 
in the the if it's in that part shade it's going to be the darker green but it's going to be in full sun it's not going to be as dark of green so you can definitely see that just that variability of light it's going to do well but it can impact its uh frond color just slightly um but it, this is one of those palms that has a very low pore salt tolerance so um if you're living over uh, along the coast just got to be very careful on where you put it um and another concern is it does produce fruit and that fruit can be an irritant. So, um, but this is a really cool uh, plant that you can use in your landscape. But I also really like it if you have a container garden, indoor house plant, if you have a full sun, part shade area, indirect light, this thing will go really, really well. And since the fruit is an irritant, um, what I usually recommend is once it's, if it's an indoor plant, there's more than likely it's not going to get too, it's not going to really get pollinated, so you won't have too much fruit production. But nonetheless, once it flowers, you can always count, just cut off the flowers before it produces fruit. So that's a dwarf sugar palm. Next, I like this one because I'm a fan of bamboo, so I like that effect and that look of it. But this is another um, pinnate frond. Uh, this is the bamboo palm, um, and it has 8B to 11, and it's really cool because you can put this in a bunch of clusters, so it kind of creates a really neat, um, it can create a cool screen. Um, but also it has that cool effect where it's, it's fruiting with that red fruit, like you can see, it almost reminds me of like a, um, a Nandina, um, and this one isn't toxic to birds like the Nandina is. So, um, but quite different than the others, it prefers shade to part shade. So it's not going to like that full sun. Um, it has this dull green color to the fronds um, and it has low, sort, low salt tolerance. And again, this is another one that's used for interior purposes if you want a container because it doesn't get too terribly tall um, and it fits well within uh, a container. I actually, before I moved to Florida growing up, we actually had a bamboo palm um, as one of our house plants, and that thing lived in that container for probably 25 years. <laughs> it was wonderful. Uh, we moved from Ohio down to Florida with it, but it was um, a great palm. So uh, next, this is a ribbon fan palm. So ribbon fan palm, it is the, the reason I like this. It's a solitary palm, so it doesn't cluster like the uh, one of the um, Everglades palm does, but 9A211, you can grow this pretty much anywhere in the county though. Um, it does get about 30 feet tall, so it actually works, fits well within the landscape for a home because of the scale and proportion of the tree in the house. Um, but it does like partial shade, the full sun, has that palmate leaf and has a deep green color. But one of the really, really cool things about this ribbon palm is the, um, the leaves the leaflets on the, the front are like deeply incised. So it has these long ribbon like um, leaflet fronds. So it's really cool effect when the wind is blowing, you see these things kind of like wave in the wind and dance in the wind. So I have visually has a really, really cool effect to it because of, you know, it's not just like moving like a palm does, but kind of like waves in the wind. <laughs> Hopefully my hands help share how that looks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is a really, really cool palm. I like seeing this from a design perspective and because of how it moves in the landscape. So it kind of creates a really unique look to it. So, and of course, you know, this palm is a little bit harder to find, but nonetheless, if, if it is, if it's something that you're able to find, it's a really cool specimen for a landscape. Needle palm, I love needle palms. Any of you have a needle palm in your landscape? And you can put that in the chat box or, 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 um, why is it called a needle palm? I have it on there. So, <laughs> so, um, needle palms are very cold tolerant. They go down to 7B, which is really awesome. They're one of our native palms. They get about five feet tall. So this is a really great specimen plant for a landscape. Now you can find these commercially. They're very slow growing. So they're, but they are expensive expensive, especially for the size that you can get them in. Um, but they are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ornamental plants for a landscape. I love them so much. They have this dark green color and they have a moderate salt tolerance. But one of the things that's really, really cool about them, but you just have to be careful, is it gets its name because of the needle palm. It, um, oh, it says great native palm, but beware the needs. It says it should say needles. 
but um, the needles get about 10 to 12 inches long and they are sharp suckers. They are so, so sharp that these dudes will like, if you poke them, oh, instant bleed. It, it, it kind of hurts a little bit. Um, and what ends up happening is like, I don't wanna say end up happening, but the reason that these palms are so cool is not only because the environmental value that they add to them, the environmental value that they add to the landscape, but also one of the really, really cool things is that um, we look at how it's used culturally. So there's this whole study of botany called ethnobotany. And it is a study of about different cultures and ethnic groups or uh, use botanies in their day to day, use botany or plants in their day to day life. And a lot of indigenous tribes uh, throughout the southeast where this grows natively, they would use the needles um, for like sewing, fishing, etc. So this is like super significant to a lot of different groups in uh, the southeast Florida, southeast part of the United States for years and years and years and years and years and years. And years. So uh, this is kind of a really neat plant to have because not only because of its look, its value has in the landscape, its environmental factor, but then also you have a really cool history of something that you can have in your landscape to understand its cultural benefit or significance too. So I love this and I also love, I've always loved pronouncing the Latin name for it when I used to do plant ID. Uh, it's called Repetophyllum, <laughs> Repetophyllum hystrix. So it's a cool, cool little one I like to say, but needle palm. I'd love to see more of these, you know, but just be careful when you have it because it hurts. <laughs> but if you want something that has like a kind of a similar look, but it doesn't have all the pokies on it, um, this is a lady palm. Lady palms are super awesome. They have very like thin uh, trunks to them, but they grow super, super dense. So you can create this really cool screen with them by planting them together. Um, they get up only about seven feet tall. So it's like the perfect fence. Um, and they have, they, they like shade the part shade. They have that palmate leaf. Um, you can put these definitely in our 8B area of the county, but just keep them closer to the building and they'll do totally fine. Um, but I know people and I've used these in designs as screens for people's homes because they just they're wonderful and they they can actually grow and propagate pretty easily um so you just need to make sure that you give it that space that it can move and spread and fill in the spaces that you want it to um and one of the things that it needs the shade the more sun it gets the more yellow it gets um some of the lady palms that i used to have um when just from the afternoon sun that they would get, just a little bit of the afternoon sun, some of the fronds would yellow just from that. From that, So it's important to know that the deeper the shade or the more shade that you have with Lady Palm, the more successful that they will be in the landscape. These are awesome, awesome plants too. Um, windmill palms, I like windmill palms uh, because they have really cool cold tolerance. They don't get too terribly big. They get about 20 feet tall. So I like using them in a landscape with that part shade, part sun, the full sun, because they add a really cool accent plant. Um, because they kind of like can rise up above a lot of the other plants around you around it and give and show that palm look. They have a nice dark green. Uh, but another thing that's really cool about it is the trunk you can see in this image, it's covered in this like fiber. Um, and that adds, and that's like just uh, like an extra layer of protection on these windmill palms. So it adds like a really cool um, element to this palm and how it can be used in the landscape. So I like, I really like windmill palms. They don't get too terribly tall. Um, they only get maybe about six to eight feet wide, if that, um, and they're really, really easy maintenance, but they help add a lot of value to a landscape uh, because of their growth habit. They don't get too large. You really don't have to manage these much at all. Um, and then kind of like a big classification of some of our other palms that do really well here um, are our Phoenix palms. So there's a whole group of Phoenix palms and they range from like 7B, 8B, all the way up to 11, zone 11. You, can, you see them all throughout the state. They're all over um, Nassau County. Um, do any of you have a Robolina palm by any chance? Put that in the chat box. 
robolinas. Does that sound familiar to you all? That's kind of like this, it's, with a lot of new construction, you're seeing people put robolina palms in landscapes because they're cold tolerant, they're easy, they look really nice, and they're usually growing in clusters, like a two or three kind of like palms together. Um, but the robolinas, they really like the full sun or all phoenix palms. Um, some will do well in part shade, but typically full sun. They're gonna have pinnate and palmate leaves, typically pinnate. Um, and they come in different types of variations of green, like a dull gray or dark. Um, and they have moderate salt tolerance. These are tough as nails. They're really, really great palms. Um, they're very adaptable, but one of the big, big things that really hurts them that we're watching is they're susceptible to lethal bronzing, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. So uh, do any of you have any of these Phoenix palms, like a Phoenix date palm, or um, like I mentioned that Robolina? Yeah, excellent. So these are all like a list of the, this isn't the uh, full list of palms, but these are some of the common palms that I, that I think are really, really cool that I wanted to share with you all. That's not just like a typical cabbage, Washington or a pindo. Um, so these are all palms that you can find commercially. Some are gonna be easier than others, but they all add different types of value to our landscapes. Um, and allows you to use them, whether it be accent plants, accent trees, they can be uh, structure plants, they can, you know, provide shade to a landscape. So palms aren't just a single tree with the fronds on top, they come in so many different shapes, they come in so many different shapes, sizes, and varieties that you can actually find so many palms that can do well in your landscape um to fit your needs you know when we think about right plant right place we think about the mature size of those palms so selecting the correct palm that does well with those environmental conditions whether it be your climate your sun shade conditions the space you want it to grow you know there's a palm that you can find that does well with our freezes and our cold temperatures um but let's talk a little bit about basic palm maintenance luckily you know establishing a palm is pretty easy you just Drop that sucker in the ground, a nice wide hole, twice the size of the diameter of the palm, and you just water it a couple times a week for about three, four weeks, and that actually helps them establish very quickly um, deep watering, uh, too, so just putting a lot of water down at one time. So usually with palm maintenance, the things that really concern that we need to make sure that we're watching out for is proper pruning, because that's a huge no-no for palms and also nutrient management which we'll talk a little bit about which we will talk about not a little about so pruning your palm only remove dead fronds old flowers and, and fruit stalks in the old fruit stalks that's it nothing else if you want to remove live healthy fronds you can absolutely do that but we always say between three and nine o'clock never remove anything above that do not touch it at all um, only remove things that are below that three, nine o'clock. Um, you, you may or may not heard the term uh, hurricane pruning, which you can kind of see on that far right part of the image. That's a big no-no for palms. Don't do that. That actually makes them much weaker. It actually makes the trunk get narrower and, uh, and it reduces the photosynthetic capabilities of the palm and just makes it much, much weaker and less resilient to hurricane damage. The only time that printing it like that is acceptable is just during transportation of palms, no other time. Um, it's also important to know that actually it's if you a potassium deficiency which we'll talk about is very common in palms but never remove potassium deficient fronds because what happens is yes that palm frond might be deficient but that palm is also reallocating some of those nutrients of potassium to the other fronds so if you remove one frond because it's potassium deficient well guess what that next frond is going to start showing more signs of potassium deficiency because the palm is going to start pulling more nutrients out of that frond. So if you remove potassium deficient fronds, you're actually going to potentially make that visually worse. Um, remove damaged fronds if needed because there can be, if there is too much removed, it can impact photosynthesis and it can make the tree weaker. And obviously never hurricane prune, that's not a thing. Don't listen to anybody that tells you you need to do it. It makes the tree very unhealthy, very weak, less resilient. So three and nine, make a big T. You know, 
never anything above three nine o'clock only below three nine o'clock and technically there's a lot of palms you don't actually have to remove anything unless you want to it's just purely aesthetic so so that's a basic pruning maintenance is so let's talk about a little bit of nutrient nutrition and fertilization so it's best to maintain proper nutrition management for your palms because once your palms show nutrient deficiencies, it can take two to three years to correct. It's like, oh man, so it's not gonna be a quick turnaround by all means. It takes a while for it to uh, fix itself um, or for you to see those improvements. Um, so typically that recommendation or ratio is what we say is eight to 12, four. You can just get palm fertilizer um, for like mild, moderate nutrient, nu nutrient deficiencies, but we want it to be slow release. And typically it's gonna be three month feeding intervals. So you're gonna be putting it down at a rate of a one and a half pounds of that fertilizer per hundred square feet of canopy. I mean, you just sprinkle it around that root zone of uh, the canopy. And you do that every three months throughout the growing season. So March, June and September um, is when you can do that. So March, April, May, June, July, August, September. Yeah, so March, June, September, 369. That's the same time that you fertilize your citrus trees. So that's a good thing to remember. Um, but anyways, so spread that fertilizer under the canopy. Make sure that's part of your regular nutrition management for your palms so you do not develop and hopefully do not develop nutrient deficiencies. Now, if you have a high pH or your pH is off, that can, despite fertilizing, that can end up impacting and you can still see nutrient deficiencies because if your soil pH is off, your plants can't recover or absorb those nutrients very well. So if you can always bring your soil to us and we can do a pH test, or you can actually send uh, your soils to our state soils lab and they'll do a pH test as well as nutrient test on those soils. Um, and I'll follow up with that information about that soil testing. So let's talk about those palm issues that we see with nutrient deficiencies because palms, they show everything. You know, they'll show any type of deficiency you have in a landscape. So they are very susceptible to showing discoloration because of nutrients. Um, like, in fact, going back to here, I know some people, because they have palms scattered throughout their landscape, they use palm fertilizer for their entire landscape. So if they're fertilizing their turf grass, they're using palm fertilizer uh, because that's helping provide those nutrients to those palms at the same time. So then that's really helping um, fight any nutrition deficiencies that you see in the landscape. But also a really cool thing is if you have a palm that's starting to show a nutrition deficiency, there's a really high chance that the other plants around that are having that same nutrition deficiency as well. So it's like a canary in the coal mine type of situation, which is kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so the, some of the nutrition deficiency, deficiencies that we see, they come up in unique patterns, which is kind of really neat. So it allows you to, to quickly look at a palm and say, oh, it's that nutrition deficiency based off of how this discoloration is occurring. So a nitrogen deficiency, is to, it's uncommon for palms, but we do see it. Um, just uniformly, we start to see the entire palm frond begin to turn like a light green color like the whole thing, not just parts of it, but like the whole thing. And it usually starts with the oldest fronds, which are the ones at the lowest, and it works its way up towards those newer fronds up at the top. So potassium deficiency, this is the most common. If people call me about, oh, my palms look kind of strange and silly, um, and I see pictures like this, it's a potassium deficiency. And actually different palms show potassium deficiencies differently. So it kind of makes it a little bit harder to kind of say, this is always gonna be the potassium deficiency, but I'm gonna share a document. This is a very common one, but I'm gonna share a document that shows different ways that our palms show a potassium deficiency. But potassium deficiency, no matter which palm though, always begins on the oldest fronds and works its way up to the youngest fronds. So that's important. Um, so you'll see like the tips of the fronds start to like brown and discolor a little bit. Um, sometimes it actually just looks like a speckled pattern all around the fronds itself. So it depends, like I mentioned on the species deficiency. Have any of you seen any of this on your palms or like a cycad or anything like this that you have? You can put that in the chat box. Ah, uh, yeah. So a couple of yeses. Yeah, one, yeah, on a mule palm. Yeah. So um, 
there's so there's a couple different ways that you can like I mentioned you see species uh, plant species or palm species show this in slightly different ways but the biggest thing is it begins in the oldest fronds it goes to the youngest and it's also important to know like I mentioned earlier don't prune them off because they look ugly um, because yes they do but it can actually make the problem worse so all right, the next is magnesium deficiency. So this is, a, again, another deficiency that starts on the oldest fronds. So this is very common amongst like the Phoenix Canariensis, so the Canary Island date palm, begins the oldest fronds um, and it works the way to the newest ones. But what ends up happening is just like the tips turn yellow. The center of the palms will still be green, but the tips begin to turn yellow. Um, while that rachis, that central part, stays green. Um, so that's a typically a magnesium deficiency, but usually that's like with pure lack of nutrient nutrient management for palms. Some palms don't even show a magnesium deficiency, but we see it in those Canary Island date palms pretty readily. And again, these are starting on the oldest fronds and working their way to the newest. Next, we have a manganese uh, deficiency. So this is typically caused by insufficient manganese or a high pH, anything above seven, so like an alkaline soil. But this, unlike the others, it actually starts on the newer fronds, the newest fronds, and then it works its way to the older fronds. And it creates like these necrotic streaks in the fronds that you can actually see um, in this images. And it actually causes this thing called frizzle top. So frizzle top is like the leaves start to like, the frond leaflets start to look a little curly and wispy um, and without nutrient management with that manganese, it can actually end up killing the palm. So uh, iron deficiencies is typically, again, happens, we start to see it on the newer fronds and it works its way to the older fronds um, and it can lead to the death of a palm. Um, usually the iron deficiency is purely gonna be associated with poor management, so like, poor planting, you planted it too deep, or there's like excessive moisture, it's constantly wet. So it's preventing those trees from taking any nitrogen. Another example could be very severe, extreme, um, like extremely high pH can make your trees, the palms unable to uptake any iron. Um, this is rare, but it does happen. And you know, it's that general yellowing of the fronds and the, the older ones stay green. So looking at a nitrogen deficiency, the nitrogen deficiency starts at the older fronds, moves to the younger fronds. Iron deficiency starts with the younger fronds and the older fronds typically kind of stay the same. They don't change. So you definitely see how it's like, they have just general yellowing, but where they're starting, whether it be the old fronds or the new fronds is how we determine what that deficiency is. So like I mentioned, it's really cool that the palms can tell us what that deficiency is, but there's just so many things that they can communicate and share with us, which makes it kind of cool. So this one I think looks cool. <laughs> it's a boron deficiency. It's like you get these like weird zigzag patterns in um, your palms and themselves. So these boron deficiencies, the symptoms occur on the newest fronts, the younger ones, um, and they will always remain visible in the fronts. They don't go away. Um, so they create like this accordion pattern um, on the fronds. And if you say you try to straighten them out, it'll actually break the frond, those parts of the frond and make them crack. Um, so this is a boron deficiency and it can lead to a fruit drop and the death of the tree. So we can actually get to a boron deficiency is so bad. You're seeing this accordion pattern on the fronds themselves, but you'll actually see the new growth and the top of the palm just kind of like slowly crumple and bend over and just, it just like went limp all of a sudden. Uh, so that's extreme boron deficiency. And once that happens, your tree is dead um, because that essentially that heart of palm, that atypical meristem at the very, very top of the palm, you just killed it, it's dead. Nothing can help it recover. Um, so this is one that if you have a boron deficiency, try to correct it, but typically nutrient management, it's going to be, it should never be a problem. So those are nutrient deficiencies. And that's usually you're seeing those as a result of poor nutri nutrient management, poor environmental conditions, or just like poor pH. Um, but we still have some other insects and stuff like that, 
that can impact our uh, palms as well. Like some of the common pests is like a palmetto weevil we can get. Um, and it's one of those things that once you get a palmetto weevil, it looks kind of looks like this. It can also be just be all black, but it has like this long proboscis, kind of looks like an elephant trunk. Um, but it's attracted to stressed palms. That's where you're going to see them. And it's usually going to be like right after during or right after planting, because that actually is a very stressful time for all plants. That's going to have a high susceptibility of attracting that uh, weevil to your palm. Um, also, over pruning can attract them. Um, and if you get them, you just got to remove them. So what they end up doing is they end up, up like kind of up towards the top or within the trunk. They'll lay eggs and they hatch and it just um, there's n there's not really an insecticide that can really help prevent or manage them. Once they're there, that's it. You got to remove the tree. So, and I've, and I've spoken with a few clients over the years or um, in extension, and I've seen this maybe a handful of times where we've had weevils um, in our palms and it's an unfortunate thing, you know, because you're losing a palm. Um, oh, going back to the common insect pest, you know, you'll still get caterpillars. You'll still get, I thought I had that slide in here. I must've taken it out. You'll still get caterpillars. You'll still get scale insects. You'll get aphids, all those typical things. Typically horticultural oils or soaps can help manage them. Um, there's one um, moth that'll lay its eggs on the palms and it does what we call skeletonizing, which is more of like an, uh, if it gets all over the fronds, it impacts the photosynthetic capabilities of the palm, but it's more of an aesthetic issue than anything. Um, and it's just similar to a leaf miner, the moth larva gets inside the frond and just kind of munches or munches around on the surface. And it almost looks like you still see the cell structures of the palm, but there's like no green, no nothing. It kind of looks like this skeleton or spider webby type of pattern on the leaf. It's kind of cool, actually. Um, so usually horticultural soaps and uh, horticultural oils can help manage those. Um, so we have fungal diseases. This is the biggie. This is the big, 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 big one. Because unfortunately, Ganoderma butt rot, if you get that, that's it. It's done. It's highly contagious and just kills the palms. And it actually survives in the soil. And you never be able to plant a palm in that space again, which is unfortunate. And if you do get this, you got to cut down the palm and try to remove as much of the root mass as possible um, to help prevent it from spreading because of how contagious it is. And one of the big ways that we recognize it is through this conch development. So these are the actual the fruiting spores of the Ganoderma. Um, this is the, the, the mushrooms. Um, and it has these like different stages. And you can see like that beginning young stage, that mature and old stage. So if you see these on your palms, you need to get them out as soon as possible because all of a sudden every palm around your tree is susceptible, around that area is susceptible from getting it. And it doesn't matter how healthy your tree is, Gandoderma will go after any tree. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't, and it won't feel rotted. Like some things that are beginning to rot with fungus, it gets really soft. You won't see that within the, that palm. You won't see that at all. It'll feel like a normal palm trunk, but then all of a sudden you got these conks developing, which means you have this severe fungal rot happening on your palm. So that's called Gandoderma or Ganoderma butt rot. So um, we also have what we call bud rot. Um, this is called, caused by a fungal pathogen called phy, uh, Phytophthora. Um, and it essentially the new leaf or that spear, leaf spear, which is that new frond that's coming up out of the top of the uh, palms, they discolor um, and there's no new growth. You know, sometimes you'll just see it. It's like the top of the palm looks like it's just starting to get empty. Um, but it's typically associated with, we'll see it with cold damage I mean, over watering. Um, there are selective fungicide applications that you can do to help correct it. But if not corrected, it can be death of that palm. This is the big one. So this is a big one because of how contagious it is and we're seeing it all over the state. Um, it's called lethal bronzing. It actually used to call, be called Texas Phoenix palm decline because we only saw this disease in Phoenix palms, but it's evolved and we're actually seeing it in pretty much every palm species, not all, but the big thing concern is we're seeing it in our native palms too, which is a huge concern because, you know, if this ends up in, within our natural ecosystems, it can end up impacting those significant 
uh, ecosystem ecological plants or processes that those native plants bring in, like those cabbage palms. Um, so it's a bacteria. So it's a bacteria, and we're not even 100% sure how it's that vector or that insect that spreads it from palm to palm to palm to palm. Uh, we're still trying to do research on that because this first showed up in Florida in 2008, and it's, it was only in like Pinellas County area, so Tampa, St. Pete, and now it is pretty much all over the state. That's how quickly it has spread in uh, about 15 years. It can only survive in the phloem of that palm. Um, so it makes it really hard to study because it doesn't have actually a cell wall. So as soon as you remove it from that phloem, it dies. That's been one of the biggest things, hindrances to making that study and research because we can't take it into a lab. We can only study live plants that have it. And that was our big issue with citrus greening because citrus greening for our citrus trees is the same issue, it has a phytoplasma that we just can't study. And it wasn't until maybe two years ago that we finally learned how to get that specific uh, bacteria uh, to live in a culture in a lab so we can study citrus greening, but we don't have that figured out yet for this uh, lethal bronzing. Um, essentially, you can see the symptoms pop up, but as soon as the symptoms occur, you just have to remove the plant immediately. And you also test nearby plants too, because if one palm has it, more than likely your neighboring palms have it as well. And I have seen this in Nassau County. I have seen lethal bronzing in quite a few instances. Um, so there are symptoms and the symptoms may, you may see them at one time. You may not see all of them. You can see them. There's not going to be a uniform pattern in which, which you see the symptoms pop up. You know, if you have a palm tree that's fruiting and all of a sudden it just drops all the fruit, like a premature fruit drop, that's a huge symptom or sign of a lethal bronzing. Uh, it's like, oh no, if you see that, cut the tree down. Um, so necrotic inflorescence, um, so that the flower, the new flowers actually have a discoloration to them. Um, and what you'll actually see is um, the older fronds, they just go brown, they discolor, and like they just die, essentially. And then you'll slowly see that death occurring up to the newer fronds. And then you'll actually, if it has that spear leaf, so that new that new leaf, you'll actually see the spear leaf just collapse over, fall over, that's the death. And once you see that, that tree is completely dead. Um, but leading up to that point, um, you can see this tree is, could have had lethal bronzing for weeks and months and it's been spreading. Uh, it's been a source to spread lethal bronzing to other trees. So that's why it's important to, if you have nearby trees, test them. Um, for it, and you can actually send samples to our uh, plant diagnostics clinic to see if you have it or not. Um, but anyways, it's just this very severe disease that we have within our palm trees, lethal bronzing. So um, because essentially it's jumped from just the phoenix palms, but now we're seeing it in many, many palms, including some of our native species, like their cabbage palms. So those are all our, you know, big concerns with those uh, palm issues, with lethal bronzing being like the big concern that uh, a lot of researchers are looking at currently now. So to help wrap everything up, because we are getting towards the end of our time, I wanna make sure we have some time for questions. Um, we sh you should be able to answer which palms grow best in North Florida. So we really talk about those really cool examples, but we talked about them, that the importance of cold tolerance and this impact on uh, palms on like how we're making sure we're making those proper selections. But also we talked about those management recommendations like pruning and nutrient management and those pests. So like nutrient deficiencies is usually like the biggest issue that we deal with with our palms is trying to make sure that we're managing nutrients uh, for those palms. But anyways, so that's kind of in a nutshell, our whole program for the day. And uh, it's 10 uh, 54. So we have a couple more minutes for uh, some questions. Um, oh, great question. What watering guidelines should we use? Palms are super drought tolerant. So once they're established, you should never have to touch them with water. They're so, so adaptable. Um, like they, it's very rare that you're gonna see a palm suffering from drought conditions, because if that's the case, then all the other plants in your landscape are gonna have severe drought conditions. Um, so with a palm, usually once it's established, you know, as with many of our plants are right plant, right place, once it's established, it'll 
rarely, very, very rarely need any type of supplemental uh, watering. I've actually seen more damage being done to palm trees because they're being watered on a normal basis because there might be in like a turf grass bed. So people are watering the turf grass, but it's also ends up overwatering that palm and that can lead to different fungal pathogens or just uh, iron deficiencies or other nutrient deficiencies like potassium um, within those palms. But that's a very good question. So the watering guidelines is once it's established, don't touch it unless you need to, but typically it's not gonna need it at all because of how, dry, how uh, drought tolerant they are. But great question. Any other questions? Anything that you found confusing or you want to make sure that you want to know more about? Um, please share that with me uh, so I can help give you that information. Um, and oh, OK, yeah, I'll help answer that question. Um, so here is a link that I'm going to go ahead and send you. That's our evaluation link. I use this with all of our programs. Um, please take a minute at the end. I'll send this out again. Uh, to make sure we use this to make sure we're improving our programs and make sure that they're actually working. Um, it's a huge help for us and we use it for the state to report. So um, if I don't have this data and evaluations and I can't report to the state, then we don't do the programs. Um, but anyways, so please take a few minutes um, to fill that out. Just a couple of questions, um, but I'll go ahead and I'll answer some of these and I will send that evaluation out. So pros and cons of sago palms. So a sago palm isn't actually a palm, believe it or not. It's not a palm. It's a cycad. Um, and But the cool thing is we can manage them and use them the same exact way as palms. They show nutrient deficiencies pretty easily, especially that like king and queen sago palm. Um, so I really like them. They're really great accent specimen plants. They're cold tolerant, um, but they are going to need that regular nutrient management because they show frizzle top, potassium deficiencies, the whole kit and caboodle. They show it too. Um, but usually if you're just following the same nutrient management as palms, they work great. Um, but they're technically not palms, which is really cool, but it does make it confusing because they're called sago palms. Um, but I really like them, but they just get a little pokey. <laughs> Um, but they do have an Asian cycad scale, which can be a really big nuisance if you get that on that on your sago palm that, yeah, horticultural oils will help control them, but it takes a lot of work to still get them under control. Otherwise, it looks like it's constantly snowing on your sago palms. And there's other cycads like the sago palm that are wonderful, like um, my favorite that I use in the landscape is Kunti. Go to cardboard plants is always a really cool one. Um, but those are really other neat cycads that you can use as well. So how do you remediate nutritional deficiencies, especially a potassium deficiency? Great question. So um, if, it's, if you have a nutrient deficiency, it's just a matter of just making sure that you begin that regular nutritional management. Um, and again, that takes two to three years to correct. It's not going to be immediate, but make sure that you're doing those proper nutrient managements um, so that three times a year throughout the growing season, three, six, nine, March, June, September, uh, one and a half pounds of that, uh, of that uh, fertilizer. I'm going to go back to that slide. Yeah, of the 8212.4, not all of them are going to be in that. You might get an 8162, so you might have to apply double that, but usually this, what's written on the bag or the label will help give you that um, rundown. So just it's a matter of just making sure you're following the proper nutrition recommendations. Now, if you are doing that and you've been seeing ongoing deficiencies for years, um, then, you know, do, let's do a pH test, because if there's a severe nutrition deficiency, you're also going to see a severe uh, manganese deficiency, and that typically is associated with pH, and there are, like, really strange ways that you can write that significant issue. Again, it takes a couple years to do, but essentially you're foregoing, like, the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, um, applications and you're just doing heavy doses of potassium and magnesium but at usually at like a three to one ratio 
Um, so it's a little bit different, but I will provide you in one of the documents I'm sending you, it goes over all those specific details because it can actually be kind of hard to get that specific uh, recommendation. I was actually working with an arborist recently who was trying to do that severe nutrient remedy uh, for a potassium for a client of his. And um, they actually had to go to a specific fertilizer vendor and get the separate components and then kind of spread them separately because you can't just go get a fertilizer uh, blend that's for severe potassium deficiency for palms. But I'll send that to you. Uh, so you can have that's going to be one of those publications but as long as you're doing that regular nutrient management or just picking it up it's going to really help it out there are strategies to adjust your ph so make sure that the plants are uptaking nutrients appropriately um, and once if you can just make a ph adjustment you'll still take a few years to see that correction but just monitoring your soil ph and make sure it's at that proper ph which is going to be around uh, five and a half to six and a half um, but if you're above seven, you're going to really start to see some of those potassium and um, iron deficiencies in your palms. Um, and if you irrigate too much, you're just flushing out um, those nutrients and you're losing a lot of them um, as well. So it's, it's a weird balance. So making sure that you're doing that three times a year, three, six, nine, that one and a half pounds of that fertilizer for 100 square feet of canopy, that's going to really put you in the right space. But if we need to make pH adjustments, um, to get you down to a proper pH, it's just going to be like an annual supplement that you do of like a sulfur, um, and that can help maintain that soil pH, allow that tree to uptake those nutrients a little bit better. That was a completely different rabbit hole. I didn't think we were going to go down. But it's a very good question. <laughs> Maybe I'll have a cold class on uh, um, the nutrients management in soil and how it moves around. So cation exchange capacity is a really cool thing to study if you like soil. <laughs> if you don't like soil, oh God, <laughs> or it doesn't interest you. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, uh, for taking the time to listen and join us for a Landscape Matters program. Uh, you know, we have our listserv be on the lookout for some of our other upcoming programs. Like on Saturday, we're having a shrub and um, tree workshop. Um, and that's a three hour workshop on Saturday. And that's actually going to be in Callahan. We had to do a site change for it. Um, it's going to be at our Callahan Extension office at the fairgrounds. But we're going to learn all about basic management for shrubs and trees throughout entire landscapes. Um, and next month, we also have some of our other Landscape Matters programs. We also have a program coming up. It's like our quarterly floor friendly landscaping program. But um, as part of signing up today, you know, we'll ha many of you are probably already on our list serve, so you'll get a lot of those announcements of our upcoming programs. Um, but I encourage you to join us for all of those um, and those upcoming programs. And also you can follow us on our Facebook page. Um, we also have an Instagram page and YouTube channel to see kind of posting of all of our different webinars, um, follow up for posts, look for program announcements, et cetera. So we try to broadcast in as many different places as we feasibly can to market as much as possible. But anyways, thank you all. And thank you for joining us. And I'll hang out for a couple more minutes if you all have any more questions. So you all take care. <laughs>